Good morning to everybody. Of course, it's a great pleasure to meet you all in person here, and I will enjoy to discuss and to learn about your experiences. Uh, but nevertheless, I think many of you also are submitted to the daily struggle for surviving with our organization in getting jobs. And just to touch this aspect of our profession, I would like to give some impressions about bridge competition. As an introduction, I will tell you about some personal experiences from the 1980s on with competitions, why bridge competitions. Then I will look back for some historic milestone and I will look into the future, what is important within these competitions. I started working after my studies in 1981, first in the office of architect Peter Zumthor, then from 1988 as an engineer. I worked in the canton of Graubünden, southeastern Switzerland, and this was at that time the canton with the biggest number of architectural competitions. And usually these competitions were open to people or offices located in the canton. And this had a an interesting effect, as there were so many competitions and some often young people won and built, and this, was, this made this provincial, provincial region of Switzerland attractive for ambitious young people, and there was like a flow of knowledge coming into our region, which made a very fruitful coming out of good buildings at that time. And I was often collaborating with architects in competitions and that yeah, gave a lot of interesting jobs. For bigger projects in Switzerland, the opening of the participants was enlarged. And so as a young engineer, I found myself together with Marcel Meili and Marcus Peter, architects, suddenly to build the biggest wooden building in Switzerland. And, and today this is very uh, you know, touching to, to think back. Nobody asks us how many wooden schoolhouses have you already built. Uh, this, was, this was clear. We had a good project. We were enthusiastic and we built it. And finally everybody was uh, happy. If you look at through the windows, you see the slabs made of hollow box timber elements. And these elements are cut out near the ends. This was on one side an architectural uh, mean to show the structure, but also for noise protection and so on. And an important strategy in this project was that we architects and engineers, we organized a contractor's competition to get the right system for these floors. This was at the very beginning of the project to be sure that in the tender phase there will not be an alternative proposal which just makes us restart the whole planning. So this is also an important aspect of competitions that they stabilize a decision. We made that in a very formal way, a jury. We invited 10 entrepreneurs, we paid them. There was a jury report, there was a public exhibition about these different uh, floor systems. And that helped the project to develop in a steady and undisturbed way. So far, this was concentrated on building. In bridge building at that time, the administration gave their jobs to the people who they took for good adapted, 
for the tasks. So also that worked. Then, 1999, Switzerland decided to open the market. So this was gone with the regional concentration of participants. It was gone with the schoolhouses where a community gave us a job. They were obliged to have at least three tenders. And very much of the work was given due to fee offers. And I remember, remember very well this was a depressing time. We, we asked ourselves about the future of our office and how to overcome these problems. And together with my partners, yeah, we decided we will try, but not to go with half of the usual fee into that market, but to try to do it on another way. And one strategy was to re-establish bridge competition. And a group of engineers, of bridge builders, went to the road administration in Graubünden and said, for the rather big TARDIS bridge, we want you to organize a competition. And that oh, competition, this is complicated, this is expensive. Uh, and, uh, and as we insisted, they said, okay, we tried, but you have to help us. And as I was somehow the speaker of this group, so uh, I got the job to organize this competition, to write the program, to moderate the jury, to write the jury report. And I was very happy on one side on that, but I felt the future of our profession resting on my shoulders. <laughs> and so I put very much energy into that thing. And finally, it worked. We made an open competition. There were about 30 entries. We found a winner. We made an extensive report. The winner was built. And finally, the road administration said, this was good. This was a good experience. Let's go on with that. And so, from that moment, uh, yeah, I could help a little bit to re-establish bridge competitions in southeastern Switzerland. And since then, okay, this has become a common way of organizing good quality jobs. Now, I change after this personal introduction to some more general remarks. In history, often competitions were milestones for new structural systems. For instance, 1896, in Bern, a road bridge competition ended with a winner project, Ehre den Stein, Honor to the Stone. And this was a nodal point in Swiss bridge building history. The winner was Robert Moser, a powerful, old, ultra conservative engineer with a big laugh for stone. Billington, in his biography of Maillard, wrote the stony hand of Robert Moser. <laughs> he was a contract dictator to Robert Maillard, of course. And he won this competition in Bern with that project, Ehre dem Stein. The bridge was not built. It was built 40 years later by Robert Maillard with a concrete structure. But Moser took the chance he made plaster models. He sent them to all cantonal building directors in Switzerland with a memorandum. In future, we have the national and solid construction way like this. And so this was the beginning of a great development. Some hundred stone bridges on the Ration Railway alone just came directly from this propaganda of Moser. And of course, steel had some problems in the 1890s, structurally and economically. And the stone were there, the stones were there. Uh, these bridges were built by bold and proud craftsmen. 
sometimes with extraordinary auxiliary structures. The Rhine Bridge in Basel was a competition with Moser in the jury, and somehow it was clear that this kind of medieval structure won. It was built, it still stands, it's a marvelous work. The old chapel was reintegrated on that pillar. And now look at the second prize, very astonishing, like concentrated on that central pillar, like an autonomous structure with stone and steel, almost not touching the ground. Very intriguing, some kind of a romantic Viennese Otto Wagner style. Also with the chapel integrated on the central tower. Uh, and yeah, this is like something I cannot decide. I, I, I love both projects, but somehow it leads to the question, should the jury decide conceptual? Should the jury say, we found out the right concept for that problem, and then all the prize-winning projects can look more or less the same? I would say this could be a very strong message to the participants. Or, as usually it is done, you have different concepts and you give the prizes to the best representants of these different concepts. But I think a jury should be clear on that line, what they want to do and what they want to create for an effect. Köln, 1961, Stress Ribbon Bridge by Ulrich Finsterwalder, Gerd Lohmer. Also, it was not the first prize, but it had a big influence also on footbridge design in the subsequent years. In Switzerland, Emil Schubiger made this astonishing transport stress ribbon bridge with 216 meters pan going to a tunnel. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore, but René Walter built this first stress ribbon bridge in post tensioned concrete in Switzerland in uh, 1969. So again, it's not the only importance of a competition to give a project to be built, but the result of a competition can be much larger. It can have an impact on a whole profession only just by recognizing different solutions. Very impressive for me, 1971, the Felsenau Viaduct competition in Bern, at that time the biggest national highway bridge in Switzerland. There were seven teams invited and I think it's intriguing if you look at this drawing. I think it's obvious which is the best project. It's absolutely clear. <laughs> look at on the right side, the uppermost. In the middle part of the valley, where the town lies, you have big spans that doesn't obstruct the valley. The R river is not touched by the bridge. On the side spans in the forest, you have economical short spans. In the section, you have one giant monumental box section. So men won with this proposal, also for reason of construction, you had three independent points of departure to build the bridge, the balance cantilever in the middle and the conventional scaffolding on the two sides. And then this magnificent section, this one cell hollow box, which influenced Swiss bridge building in the following years to a great extent. Here you see, as the bridge leaves undisturbed the river, like this, and the big spans in the residential area 
a great work of Christian men. Okay, now some conclusions for competitions today. Probably this is about the same in different countries, but we have the two Swiss codes which regulate project competition that can be open or pre-selected, invited, usually anonymous. You have the full service competition with contractors and a fixed price, or you have parallel mandates. In the following, I want to concentrate on the project competition. As I said in the beginning, I think open competitions are important for young people. This is what we can do to encourage young people to our profession. And so, for me, this is the main interest, the open competition. You have the triangle, client, jury, participants, and especially the participant has a lonely job. And the jury must know that. And it's very banal what I want to say. The jury must write a very precise program so that the participant knows what the jury thinks. And I just take some case studies now. The most important thing on a bridge is the site, where it starts, where it ends, where it has supports. And let's take Brunel in the Avon Gorge competition, 1829. Brunel was recovering from his severe accident in the Thames Tunnel flooding, and so during this time he drew that proposal for the Clifton Bridge at the age of 23. He uses the natural pylons delivered by the Terra. He has a stabilizing cable underneath the bridge. I mean, this is a, a timeless concept by the 23-year-old Brunel. Many of us, me too, uh, have interpreted this concept, I think. And then, what happened? The old Telford judge said, this is too long. Probably he didn't want Brunel to depass his Minai straight suspension bridge. And Telford said, okay, let's do a part of that competition. I propose this design, 110 meter span. And also for the community, this was too much. Brunel commented about such a timidity, and finally the community decided to get off with Telford and to repeat the competition. And then the second time it worked for Brunel, he proposed that more conservative design with a 192 meters span, which had to be paid with that giant block abutment, but at least it worked. And today, still, this is a yeah, impressive testimony of the genius of Brunel. So, the freedom to choose the location of the bridge is very important. The little Suransuns bridge we did in '97 was done with a careful analysis of the possible locations. Finally, we placed the bridge here because this was not a good terrain to cross, this valley also not, but all the others placed the, br placed the bridge here. And of course, they had the much shorter bridge, the much cheaper bridge, but the access didn't work, so it was quite easy to win that competition with the right location. And I mean the stress ribbon with the granite, and so this was like the dessert. This is not the most important thing about that bridge, but the location is it. Imagine here in the background a bridge there, and how will you get there? You have to repair this access all the time. So again, the site as the most important decision for a bridge. In Kur, St. Luzzi Bridge, the upper photo is the winning design by Schleich Bergermann and our office. 
it's the shortest possible bridge in the area with the longest span. And these few words say that it is a very compact uh, contact to the environment. Whereas the third prize has a shorter span, but a longer bridge and a lot of pillars. And the jury thought as a whole the limited impact into the landscape would be the more appropriate solution here. And again, choosing the right place. Bondo, 19, uh, 2017, a big rockfall went down about 1,000 meters, creating a mud flow or a rock flow. And this is the moment where this old punt is destroyed. Finally, it looked like that. This is a tunnel mouth. This has been the cantonal road. And there were emergency measures, but finally there was a competition for rebuilding that whole area. A big competition with landscape architects and architects and hydraulic specialists, road builders. And the old pond was here. Uh, Here, destroyed bridge. And of course, also following the program, we studied a new bridge here, but with the requirements to the profile, it became very steep, like a medieval arch bridge with 16% incline. And so alternatively, we just very abstract thought, what happens if we limit the incline to 10%? And then we started to wrap the bridge around that flood profile and we came to a completely different location, which is this. So the old bridge and the new bridge starts in a right angle to get into the existing road. Mm -hmm. And with that position, we could limit it, the incline to 10%. And yeah, finally, this was something the jury convinced. So at the same time, it's kind of a footbridge as a viewpoint. Yeah. Positioning the bridge. A counter example in Arau, the old town, the gate to the old town, the axis of the medieval road. This was clear, the position of the bridge, that was no discussion, it had to be there, like it always was. An existing bridge from the 1950s, also the two pillars, they were intact. In the program, we wrote, the pillars must be kept. So we thought the more clear we are in the program, the better for the participants. Second prize, a solid, robust system based on a triangular shape, geometry. And the first prize, this kind of shell structure. So here it was urbanistic, thinking that led to the final discussion, the very beautiful integration of the side walls into the bridge and unanimously the jury decided for the most expensive proposal and here the politicians they present the model of this bridge because this was a public votation and finally they accept it. So after more than 10 years now the bridge is building. This is just a view uh, with the side walls. So that's how it is now and next year it will be opened. And I think this is a very extravagant but also a very good design. Then a railway bridge 
a second railway bridge beside that old structure, which is in good condition, which will stand for a long time anymore. Again, an open competition I was allowed to organize. And here we indicated some possible positions of the rails. Railways are not so flexible, so this had to be just given different options where you could place the bridge. And also here, the existing pillars had to be taken for the axis of the, for the position of the new pillars. So the points of support were more or less given in contradiction to the first examples. But now I make just a short, like a film, show how variable these entries are. There were 40 entries and it was good that we had 40 entries because this was somehow like a comprehensive uh, yeah. show what all is possible with these given supports. Concrete trusses, continuous post-tensioning girders, but finally, the question of neighborhood of the old and the new bridge was very important. You had some kind of mimetic proposals. This was the fifth, fifth prize. In fact, two bridges, one over the road, one over the river, fourth prize. Third prize, second prize, and the winner by three Neil engineers with Galmarini and Dissing Weitling and Hager. The reason to let it win was that it didn't obstruct the view from the south, the less on the old bridge, but at the same time, it was a very good construction which also could stand alone. Second prize, which is a good solution per se, but the neighborhood, we thought, was not treated in the same sensitive matter as the first prize, which you see here. And this is a section with the old bridge on the right, and you see the different positions, and the winner is the green one here, with the highest level of the low surface of the bridge. We discussed about mimicry. In the back, an old riveted bridge from 1911. In the foreground, a welded, screwed bridge from 1972. That goes very well together. But it seems that it is not possible with bridges before 1900 to do the same. So here, it's not a mimesis, but it's the free view which was determinant. I finish with an example of an entrepreneur's competition. This is one of the biggest railway bridges in Switzerland, the Grand Fay Viaduct. And you see there is a footbridge going underneath. A very long arcade, highly impressive, and this should be opened for bicycles now. The problem is, there are steep steps on both ends, and then Richard Serra in the 1990s built a sculpture into it, <laughs> and of course everybody is annoyed with this sculpture, but I mean, it's so essential, this sculpture, to emphasize this is like going onto a mountain. You really have difficulties to come up, and then you are up, and then you have this horizontal, long passage, and that's so good. But of course, for cyclists, this is not good. They just try it on the left to, yeah, make it a bit more comfortable, but this is... And, and, I was asked to organize a competition for ramps. And at first, uh, the conservationists said, so ramps, you, can, you cannot do that, and so on. But finally, 
we thought, as you remember on the first slide, that there is a lot of forest on both sides. And to build a ramp like this, taking into account the main axis comes from here. So normally you still cross the stairs and the Serra sculpture. But if you have a bicycle or children carriage or something like that, you can go up this ramp in the forest and enter the main bridge in the first opening. So it looks like that. And it will be in the forest. And finally, I thought it's not use to make a project competition for that thing. Maybe this was a bit egocentric, but I, I thought this is the only way you can do it in a yeah, acceptable way. And so we decided to take that project and to make a contractor's competition about the building process in that forest, how to drive the piles, how to install the structures without destroying the forest, because this, was, this is a very important aspect of this project. So this is kind of a footbridge competition in a bit a different way than normally. Okay, I finish with this slide where I try to summarize some main points. I mean, maybe some provoking thing. I think a small jury who can cooperate is very, very good. And also, what I always recommended is working with mock-ups and omitting renderings in a competition. Renderings are beautiful. I remember some renderings from old competitions, but they can be so misleading. A good renderer can make a very beautiful picture from a bad project. And that's a danger. I think mock-ups don't lie. So this is a, <laughs> something I really want to emphasize. Okay. With this, I want to encourage you to participate, but also to organize competitions. Because finally, it's we, as engineers or architects, who have to tell the clients what they have to do to get a good project. Thank you.